There was a mother who had two seven-year-old twin boys, and she referred to them as the monsters of mayhem. If there was trouble to be found, they either instigated it or they were smack dab in the middle of it. She was at her wit's end of what to do with the two boys, and so she knew of a pastor in town that was good with helping to set young boys straight. So she went to the pastor and asked if he would sit down with her boys, and he agreed to do so, but he only agreed to do so if he could meet with them individually. So she said, okay, I'll send one to your office in the morning, and I'll send the other to your office that afternoon. So the morning came, and the first twin sat down in the pastor's office. This pastor was an imposing figure, and he had kind of a stern voice. And he looked at the seven-year-old boy, and he said, son, can you tell me where God is? And the boy just sat there. He really didn't know what to say. And So after a few moments of silence, the pastor looked at him once again, said a little more sternly, Son, where is God? And the boy opened his mouth, but there were no words coming out. He really didn't know exactly what he was supposed to say. And for a third time, the pastor looked at him and shook his finger and said, Where is God? And the boy jumped from the seat, ran all the way home, and hid in his closet. His other twin found him hiding in the closet. He went over and said, well, what's wrong? He said, we've really done it this time. We are in serious doo-doo. God is missing, and they think we did it. We are glad you're not missing this morning. We are glad that you are here and accounted for, whether you're here in person Are you worshiping with us online? If you're worshiping with us here and you're visiting with us today, we're especially glad you're here. We have visitor cards that we would like for you. If you'd like to give us any information about yourselves, we'd love to have a record of your visit with us. Uh, If you'd like to give us your email address, we can get you on our announcements list and let you know of other opportunities that we have for worship and fellowship uh, here at the church and get you also uh, where you can receive Pastor Tim's devotionals uh, during the week as well. So we're glad you're here. If you're visiting with us, if you wouldn't mind taking a moment to fill that out uh, and let us know how we can minister to you. As far as announcements today, we do have printed announcements in each of our foyer areas. Also, our announcements are on the church website as well. A couple that are urgent. Uh, We do not have Sunday school classes today because we are having a church-wide breakfast. So after this service in the fellowship hall, The breakfast is being sponsored by Wayne Thrasher's Sunday School class, and from what Princess Pam has told me, it is going to be a soiree of breakfast goodies. So I'm not sure exactly what all is going to be there, but join us after the service today, and we'll all partake of those festivities and goodies. Uh, Also, another announcement. This is something new that uh, my wife Anita and I we're, we're starting up in July. The first uh, of these occasions will be Friday, July 22nd. We're starting for members of our congregation who are widowed or singles, ages 18 to 105, you know, over 105, we'll allow it. Um, but we're doing a bingo night uh, in the fellowship hall. We're going to have the bingo wheel. Anita's going to play Vanna White and spin the wheel. I guess we'll just call you Vanna Off-White. Little, whatever works. But we'll have the bingo wheel. We got the bingo cards. We're going to do HEB gift cards as giveaways. The grand prize is going to be a $50 HEB gift card for a blackout bingo. Ooh. Ah. Yep. So uh, we invite all of our singles and widows to to come and participate in fellowship. We will have light refreshments uh, as well. Uh, For uh, preparing for our offering, our time of offering, you know, Pastor Tim, I was thinking the other day, offering is the only time that any and all churches welcome all denominations. (laughs) 
don denominations of five, 10, <laughs> 20, 50, 100. We welcome whatever denomination. Uh, we do have different ways that you can give offering, either in the offering boxes that we have in the foyer areas, either online, or you can mail it in as well. As we prepare for our privilege of communion, I wanna share with you a story about a remarkable individual. He was a wartime hero. He was an army officer. He was a politician, a historian, a writer, an artist, and he was also quite funny. Uh, there was one occasion where he said there's only two things more difficult than giving an after-dinner speech. One is climbing a wall which is leaning towards you, and two is kissing a girl who is leaning away from you. There was another occasion where he was in a heated argument with a, a lady, and this sour lady looked at him, turned to him, and said, if I were your wife, I would poison your tea. He looked directly right back at her and scowled, if I were your husband, I would drink it. <laughs> He came from a prominent family. His father largely ignored him and scored him throughout his life. He was raised in large part by a nanny who taught him the ways of God. He was taken prisoner in battle, but he escaped and made his way into politics uh, where he served as the first Lord of the Admiralty during World War I. But it was a planned invasion of Turkey that went horribly wrong, and he lost over 100,000 of his men, and he resigned in disgrace. His wife, Clementine, later told a biographer, and I quote, due to the enormity of the burden, I thought he would die of grief. But he regained prominence, regardless of the failure, and he also had a speech impediment, and he was elected prime minister of the United Kingdom. And to this day, he is considered to be one of the greatest wartime leaders of the 20th century. He and his wife lost a child when the child was in infancy. They lost another child to suicide. This man himself suffered depression throughout most of his life. But he made a conscious decision that he would not let bitterness cloud his future and he would not let failure define who he was. In 1964, a nine-year-old girl, little Colombian girl, wrote a letter. She sent it without a stamp, and it was simply addressed to the greatest man in the world. The postal workers were not sure exactly what to do with it, but there was one who was wise, and he smiled, and he said, I know exactly where it needs to go. The letter was forwarded to 28 Hyde Park Gate, London, England, where a 90-year-old man opened the letter, read it, and he smiled. You may have figured out his name by now. His name is Winston Churchill, a man who harnessed his failure and experienced great victory. Winston Churchill's story reminds me of another politician that was born 3,000 years previous to him in King David. King David was well acquainted with failure, with Bathsheba as a king, and as a father, but he did not let failure define him. In reading and studying King David, I find great comfort in his story because I can see how God can even work through someone like me whose failures are ample. King David was not defined by his failures. He went to God and he repented of his sin and he asked God to give him a clean heart. And then he spent many days writing about joy. King David experienced the grace and the mercy of God. He knew that his life was in God's hands. And that's why we come to this moment to remember and reflect. We are not defined by our failures. We are not defined by our circumstances. We are defined by whose we are by the finished work of Christ who reconciled us to himself, redeemed us, and we are defined as child of God, perfect masterpieces through Christ our Lord. And it was on that day where Jesus took the bread, 
and he broke it, and he said, this bread represents my body broken for you. Take and eat, and as often as you do, do so in remembrance of me. Jesus then took the cup, and he said, this represents my blood shed for you for forgiveness of your sins, and that you may have life and have life eternally now and forevermore. Take and drink, and as often as you do, do so in remembrance of me. And all God's children said, Amen. so be it. Well, good morning, everyone. Sally, I want to say thank you, because when you sang out like that, I said, I'm not the only one, because I'm always singing the words before you guys, like you have a pause in the music, and I just, and I'm like the only one singing it, and I was like, well, Sally did it too. <laughs> oh, gosh. I uh, hope you had a uh, really good week. I'm very excited that um, today will be the first time in years where all of my children and grandchildren will be together. And I'm making hamburgers. The last cow we killed, that's all we got. And we're going to try and get rid of that. But it'll be, be fun. Like our son Joel flew out from... San Francisco, he's our forensic psychologist, and he was there last night, and I could tell in his mind, he was like, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, yeah, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. yeah, a lot of, mm-hmm, yeah, mm-hmm. but, um, and Megan down, Ryan's coming down with his wife and kids, Katie will be here, it's just going to be a fun time. Um, many of you have, you know, I talked the last couple of weeks about all the stuff that's going on in Sri Lanka. And uh, during this week, it got even worse, where they actually invaded the presidential, it's kind of like the official president's house, and then there's this big building and a temple area, and the prime minister, and they went in, the crowds were so huge, they went in, they started fires, uh, everybody left, and has a, the whole government has agreed to resign. And the people are upset because, one, there's no food, there's no medicine, and there's no fuel. And the government is totally corrupt. And so I told you what I you know, was trying to do was start a feeding program. And so I sent what resources I had, and I had a couple of pictures I wanted to show you that they started this. We, we're only doing this on Saturday, and we're getting different churches we work with as we have resources to send to the church, and then the church people... Um, you know, make the food and then invite people from the surrounding areas. Most of these are very, you know, very poor areas and then invite them in for a meal and it gives them a chance to share the gospel. And, you know, it's a, a scratch on the surface, but uh, it's something we can do. And for everyone who helps uh, Vanessa and I with uh, these projects, I just wanted you to see there's, there you go. Yeah, there you go. Does that remind you of anything, Randy? Yeah, that doll right there. That's the stuff that'll go right through you. <laughs> It'll light up your life <laughs> in more way than one. <laughs> That's the whole point. <laughs> People say, what are we eating? I'm like, don't ask questions you don't want the answer to. <laughs> Literally, like one time I'm in the jungle in Thailand and and I'm dipping my rice into this bowl, and the guy, uh, you know, uh, around the, we're sitting in a circle, and he goes, ah, oh, teacher, I didn't know you ate dog. And I was like, I didn't either. <laughs> yeah, there's some really gross ones, like the time I reached up and found out I had a lizard in my mouth and had to swallow it whole. <sighs> or the rat guts, did I tell you about the rat guts? Anyways... Just don't ask. There is times when ignorance is absolutely bliss. Now, you may deal with it for the next three days, but, you know, all right. Anyways, last week, and really the last couple of weeks, we've seen John make this very clear declaration that we are the beloved of God, we're loved by God, we're called to love others, and because we've been blessed by God, then we're to, uh, to live a life 
that expresses itself selflessly and sacrificially in how we give to others. And so the way we give is not like, you know, somebody getting up and saying, everybody's got to do this. It's a, it's a moving of the Spirit of God. And we say, listen, I have been blessed and everything I has come from God. Now, God, what do you want to do with this? Now, our instinct is to immediately say, yeah, but I don't have anything, which we know isn't true, because even in our most difficult situations, we realize that most of our problems are because of abundance, because of too much. And I I fall into the whole thing, right? Like I'm sitting there pumping gas, and I'm like, golly, you know, look at the price of gas, and I still pump it. And we say, well, I don't have anything. Well, that's just not true. It's that we need to re-examine and say, Lord, how is it that you want to give through me? It's not guilt. It's not shame. It's not by compulsion. It's simply an expression of love. And John asks a very pointed question. He says, how can you see these needs in the world, you who have the goods, you who have been blessed, and no other people like the American people have been so blessed, and most of us living here in Bernie or the hill country, we can't say we're the poorest of the poor. Just give me a break. We are incredibly blessed. And he says, now how you who are blessed can see all of these needs in the world and shut your heart? How can you do, how can the love of Christ abide in you? He's saying there's a contradiction. Like our hearts, we should see that these things that we've been blessed with are all about advancing the kingdom of God. And we need to individually be willing to say, how does the love of God abide in me? And yet I close my heart to these needs. And I only focus on mine. To know Christ, who is generous and laid down his life for us, is to allow that loving generosity to flow through us. So uh, in in verse 21 through 24, we're going to finish chapter 3 today. He, um, He says, Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence before God. And whatever we ask, we receive from him because we keep his commandments and do what pleases him. And this is his commandment, that we believe in the name of the Son, uh, his Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another just as he has commanded us. And whoever keeps his commandments abides in God and God in him. And by this we know that he abides in us by the Spirit whom he has given us. Well, Father, I pray that you would just work in us and speak through your servant into the hearts of your beloved. And Lord, transform us in every way. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So he says, beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence before God. To see that the, 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 the true Christian relationship is an understanding of the heart. Now we want to make it like the intellect, right? We want to be we want it to be about the doctrine and the things that we know. But he said when when you really have this intimate relationship with Jesus Christ, he says it you, you're going to know. You hear the voice of God. You know what he desires to do. And too many Christians go throughout, throughout their life and they never hear the voice of God. They just act out of their instinct. And he says, he said, listen, I don't want you to live in condemnation. He says, because we saw this last week, he goes, because God is even greater than that. He came to deal with all of the guilt and all of the shame. And he says, so if your heart is not condemned, if you have a confidence that you're living out of his life, that you see him working in you, that, that gives you confidence to take every state. See, we always think about, like, what is faith? But faith is simply me hearing the voice of God, what he's prompting me to do, how he's prompting me to give, and saying, okay. Sight is me looking at my checkbook and crying and saying, there's no way. But faith is me saying, Lord, 
What do you want to do? And do it. And see, that is the heart that builds confidence towards God because now we know our trust is bigger than us. If we just look at our circumstances, we're putting all of our trust on us instead of him who is the source of everything. And when we see what we can do, that's very limited. But what we see, when we see God doing what he only can do, what only he can explain, uh, take credit for, then we're saying, wow, now I have this confidence ever growing in my heart. We need to abide in him, right? We need to live in him. We need to hear his voice, and we need to let, it, let him flood our hearts with truth. And then we live a life free from condemnation. The one whose heart that, that does not condemn him is not looking at himself at all. You get it? It's kind of like ties in, like when we're doing communion. Like if you look at you, I don't know some of you very well, but if I know some of you enough to you, that you got a history, and uh, like if, if you were writing your history, that, would we be redacting certain things? Right? We'd be like, "Oh, let's skip that little event. Let's skip that chapter. Let's skip that." You know, all of us. You guys looking at me like I you don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> So we would all kind of would rewrite it, but he's saying that's the problem. That's where the condemnation is. If you start looking at you, you start looking at your history, you start looking at your failures, man, there's condemnation, there's shame. If you look at what you've determined you're going to do and then failed, there's guilt and shame. But that's why he's saying, no, you're looking at the wrong person. What we're looking to, the way we gain confidence, is to look to the cross, to see Jesus on the cross, taking on himself all of our sin, every failure, paying the price in full, rising from the grave to announce that we are now victorious. So our, our view is not us, but him, and that produces confidence. Philippians 3.3 3 says, For we are the circumcision, whose worship by the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. What does he mean, circumcision? Well, he's dealing with this problem because in Judaism, right, the men were circumcised on the eighth day. Now, here's the interesting thing about circumcision. Nobody knows. I mean, you know but nobody else knows. God knows, and you know. And he says, I got a different kind of circumcision. You see, I have a circumcision that's not just for men on the eighth day. It's for every human who receives me, and it's a circumcision of the heart. It's a circumcision which takes place that releases the sinful flesh that we all have from who we are as an identity and a power. So that we can now live, not out of our wisdom, but his. Not out of our spirit, but his spirit. And so he says, that's the circumcision we have of the spirit of God. And so it's all about what? The glory of Christ Jesus. So the whole mission and purpose of life is that the glory of man, ourselves, or even others, it's the glory of Jesus Christ. Because he's the only one who gives us his standing. Sure, we have some successes, but we also have plenty of failures. And it's not like we're weighing the balance. Don't even go that way. He says, listen, the glory is all upon him. And he says this, he says, and put no confidence in the flesh. So let me ask you this, where's your confidence? Where's your confidence? Every time we resort to human reasoning, human principles, the, the philosophies of the world, we have misplaced our trust in the flesh. Now, when we operate in the world, this is what we see. But he's saying, I'm calling you to another kingdom, another way of life. 
that you don't just think with your head, you listen to the Spirit of God. The world might say, now, you know, if you do that, that's crazy. But you say, yeah, it's crazy. It's irresponsible. But it's what God wants me to do. He says, and whatever we ask, we receive from him because we keep his commandments and do what pleases him. Think about that. So we have confidence. It all works for the glory of God, and we have to keep his commandment because we do only what pleases him. Amen? Amen. That's all of us, right? Yeah, that's the whole, our whole lives are defined by this verse right here. We can go home. I mean, go have breakfast, whatever. Oh, they're not ready. I better keep going. (laughs) How transformative would it be if the sum total of our life was what pleases him? Not what pleases me, not what pleases you, what pleases him? And we know this, right? He's saying we experience this confidence and we have a confidence that we can come to God and ask whatever we will. Why? Because we love one another. And we do what pleases him. So now you lift part of this verse out of context and you say, Lord, uh, you say I can ask whatever I want. So I I want a new Harley. Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I have the promise of God. I'm going to get me a new hog. He's saying, that's not what we're talking about. Now, you, I, I really don't want a new Harley because in my present condition, it would be a waste. But we understand that prayer is our setting aside our agenda to seek his. Now, no one in here has an agenda. Most of all, not me. But he's saying, what do I, how do I become, what what, what is my attitude in prayer? How do I come before him? Not my will, yours. This is the beginning point. Otherwise, we're treating God as though he was somehow a cosmic vending machine. You know, put a few prayers, a few coins in and, and God gives it to you. He's got to, because he made this promise. He said, whoa, 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 let's come in and bring it all into context. Have you set aside your agenda? Are you seeking his will? Are you seeking what expresses love and what pleases him? Ask away. That's a great privilege. Always coming back to the idea that what it's about is how to express love. How to do and practice what pleases him. In Philippians 4 through 6, he says, Do not be anxious about anything, but in, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. So we, we understand that this is always in the context of loving others. And now we have this confidence because we know that he is going to provide all of our needs because he selflessly and sacrificially gave himself for me. Now I can selflessly and sacrificially give, trusting him to be my source. This is a confidence. This is a freedom. This is a liberty. He's calling this, this is what it is to walk in a responsive and obedient relationship with the Spirit of God. But you have to set aside the intellect, the man-centeredness, the worldly way of thinking of me first. Because it's antithetical to the gospel. He goes, and this is his commandment, that we believe in the name of his Son, Jesus Christ. And you go, oh, man, I believe in Jesus. But do you? Oh, yeah, because uh, I was at the, you know, I was at summer camp and I prayed a prayer. Or, 
I grew up in a Christian home and I've always believed in Jesus. Now think about it. When the Bible talks about, about believe, is it, is it, does it mean that he, you just agreed with some facts or historical perceptions? No, it means so much more. To believe upon literally means to entrust myself to. You see, this is, this is where we, we really misunderstand. We use these terms in the wrong way. We say, oh, I've got my ticket to heaven, but I'm going to live life for me, and it's me, my way, until that point. Well, I hope you can cash that ticket in, but he, that's not what it is to believe. To believe means I accept that Jesus is who he says he is, that he's the Lord of all creation. And I entrust myself to him. To entrust myself to him is to not look at me and my performance, it's to look at the cross and to know that he lives in me and that he has every right to reign over my life. That I no longer live for myself. It's not my life, my way, my will, but it's him. He says, listen, this is the commandment that we entrust ourselves to him who loves us. He doesn't have a list of do's and don'ts. He calls us to believe in the Son and to let the, the love of the Son flow through us to others. To believe in his name is to believe in the nature and the character of a person, that he is who he says he is. It is to know that he is the Lord, the rightful ruler of my life. He goes, and love one another, just as he has commanded us. Like even back in the Ten Commandments, right? Well, we, we, we recognize that commandments aren't really suggestions, and that if we have an authority who gives us a commandment, well, we don't even have to pray about it, do we? Are you guys hearing me? Like, nod your head. Act like you're awake. <laughs> well, Mike and I got a deal. I look at him and he says, amen. Amen. But, but why do we treat all these things as though they were suggestions? Why do, we, why do we operate on the assumption that it's really me and my best life now, and that's what I want to do, never realizing that the Lord is the one who rightfully rules, reigns, directs my life, and he is the only one who knows what's best for me. And that is to love, to love others. And you know, sometimes it's just hard to love people. Because, like, if everyone was as nice as my dogs, I mean, that would make a great congregation. Like, every time I walk in, all the tails would be wagging. And, I mean, I can go down, take out the trash, come back in, and they're all excited. But he's saying, people, can I transform you? Because you were made to be great lovers. Now, the world says, oh, a great lover, uh, uh, sex. Gosh. Come on, give me a break. This is the agape. He said, I created you a new creature to be a great lover one who is greatly expressing selflessly and sacrificially doing and working for the benefit of others. And this is your great joy and confidence. This is what I have commanded you. I mean, John repeats this over and over. It's so vital to our understanding of what true Christianity is all about. We're called to love in the same selfless, sacrificial way that we've been loved by Jesus. 
and we can't settle for anything else, and we got to quit making excuses for it. He says here that he has commanded us. It's singular. It's one. He goes, I don't have 10 commandments for you. I don't have 660-some regulations. He goes, I got one command. Love, selflessly, sacrificially. And I know that some of you are going to say, well, you know, I just, I'm just not feeling it. I'm just not feeling it. I don't care how you feel. What did I hear? Facts don't care about your feelings. That's what I heard. Facts don't care about your feelings. But we're a society that operates on how I feel. Oh, and I feel like this, and I feel like this, and I feel like this is good, and I feel like this is just, and I feel this, and I feel that. And we operate out of our feeling. He says, no, one commandment. It's selfless, sacrificial. It's a verb, not an adjective. First Peter 1.22 says, and having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth, for a sincere brotherly love, love one another earnestly from a pure heart. You see what he's, Peter's saying the same thing? He said, listen, for your spirit to come alive is for your soul to be liberated. The, your soul has been liberated because you obeyed, you entrusted yourself to him who is love. And he says, now you can love this way. He gave you a new heart, a pure heart. Tap into it. Listen to it. Hear it. Galatians 5.14 says, For the whole law is fulfilled in one word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. And that's why I always say, poor neighbor. <laughs> so I don't want you to love me the way you love your neighbor if you don't love your neighbor. <laughs> like if all you have is built up resentment and anger towards your neighbor, don't love me that way. <laughs> he says, love your neighbor as you love yourself. So he says, be invaded by God's love to know that you are his beloved. Let that outrageous, generous outpouring of his love fill you and transform you and set you free and then go love people like that. John 13, 34, he says, a new commandment I give to you that you love one another just as I have loved you. You are also to love one another. So until we have a right understanding of God's love, or if we have a distorted understanding of God's love, we aren't going to love that way. And we understand that loving isn't condoning or ignoring their sins. Because he's, now we have like a church movement or different churches that say, oh, we just love everyone. And by that, we mean we just accept whatever sinful practice they're into. But that's not love. That's really a, a passive form of hatred because you're allowing them to pursue a life of self-destruction and you're condoning it. You're saying, that's okay. We accept you. It's not that we don't love them or accept them. We tell them sin is sin and sin is destructive and it's going to destroy you in the end. And I love you enough to tell you what God tells you. That's love. Love is saying the hard thing when people don't want to hear it. Self-love is me just saying whatever you know keeps everybody happy with me. He says, whoever keeps his commandments abides in God and God in him. So how again do we know that God lives in us and we're living in him? Simple. We sign our names to the church covenant and we attest to these certain doctrines. That's how we know. No, it's not how we know. 
We can sign the covenant and we can sign the doctrine saying and we can be good Baptists and good Presbyterians and good Methodists and good whatever. It doesn't matter. But Jesus says, we know that he's living in us and we're living in him. We know he's the source because something really strange has happened. We have been liberated to love. The evidence of our living from his life is always obedience. We hear him, we obey. He tells us something, and we're like, that's ridiculous. I can't afford that. I don't have the time to go there. That's not convenient to my schedule. So what are we saying? We're not living from his life. We're living from our own. Let's just be honest about it. I know that I'm living from his life. He's li I'm living in him and he's living in me when I say, yes, whatever you want. Whatever you want to do through me. Whatever you want to give to me. How do you want to minister through me? What was his command? To love. 1 John 2, 3 and 4, he says, And by this we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commandments. And whoever says, I know him, but does not keep his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. Oh, man, that's good preaching right there. That's going to give you all kinds of warm, fuzzy feelings. But why would John say that? That's not very nice. He said, because there's a lot of people who come to church who are lying. They're lying to themselves. If we're living self-centered, self-pursuing lives, we're just lying. And if you live in a deception, well, you can live in that deception for a long time. But John confronts it because he wants the veil to be removed from our eyes so that we can really be free. And by this we know what he, that he abides in us by the spirit whom he has given us. Do, do you see it? He says, you haven't been left to your own resources. He goes, I put my own spirit in you. And his spirit in you, working in you and speaking to you and revealing things to you, gives you this confidence to know, I know him. I don't know about him. I know him. There is an intimacy in this kind of knowing. I have a promise that all of his commands are promises. That what he tells me to do and where he sends me to go and what he asks me to give, they're all promises. They're all promises. He goes, I'm the source. And that's why I put my spirit in you. We know he is living in us because we see him loving through us. And so this leads us in a very different way of living. You see, the Spirit of God and the Spirit of the world are opposed to each other. But how often do we make decisions based on the spirit of the world because it makes sense to us instead of hearing his voice. You know what? The spirit of the world might seem very reasonable, calculating, but the spirit of Christ is crazy generous. Man, he loves you at your worst. Then we love our enemies and our neighbors and others 
and it changes everything. Have you believed on the name of Jesus? No, I mean seriously. Have you believed? Have you entrusted yourself to him and his finished work? Have you believed? Do you really believe that he is who he says he is, that he has every right of ownership over your life to rule and reign in you? Have you entrusted yourself to him? So then live as a confident saint that expresses his life. Confidence. Man, I have this confidence. Because he's doing something crazy in me. He's releasing me of bitterness and hatred and anger and resentment so that this vessel can be a vessel that loves others, that doesn't seek my will first, but sets my agenda aside and says, Lord, what do you want? This is what it is to live in a relationship with his spirit. Now, I get it. Because like when I was Catholic, you weird people would come up and say, do you have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ? And I'm like, get out of here. But then I realized most evangelicals do not have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. They have a ticket to heaven. What I'm asking you is are you living in a responsive, obedient relationship to the indwelling spirit of God. Will you stop, hear his voice, and say yes? Will you set aside your agenda and say, only your will, Lord. This pleases you. This is my one pursuit. What pleases you? Lord, thank you for your wonderful love to us. And I pray that you would just minister powerfully to our hearts and transform us. We pray in Jesus' name. Hey, will you all stand up real quick? I am assuming that breakfast is ready because someone just walked right down the aisle in the middle of my sermon to get Steve. I didn't let it stop me, though, Steve. But anytime you want to have a conversation right in the middle of the sermon, just you go right ahead. (sighs) Father, we are broken vessels. But we entrusted ourselves to you. And we ask that you would just fill us to the fullest, to the freshest, with the abundance of your overflowing love and that we might freely express it and seek what pleases you. We pray in Jesus' name, amen.